Welcome back, everyone, to our ongoing series, The Intersection of Technology and Insert Blank. We've been doing a lot on art, uh, music, books. Today, we're going to step outside that zone uh, quite a bit and talk about politics. And it's something I'm very excited to talk about, especially being a denizen of the D.C. scene, a lifelong resident. I think I've always had a, an unhealthy interest in politics, um, understanding how things work. But one of the reasons I understand things probably as well as I do, assuming I know them half well, is because of my good friend Mike Shields, uh, who is a, a very influential person in the Republican Party. I think I first met him at a Young Democrats meeting at George Mason, and then things took a turn for the better. Uh, but seriously, uh, Mike, I, I, I wouldn't even try to introduce him because his, he's already had an unbelievably rich and varied career. Um, suffice it to say, his insights onto both the political scene and how things work and perhaps more importantly, the ways in which technology uh, enforces everyone to keep up with what's going on to their own benefit uh, will be very instructive here. So Mike, welcome aboard, and uh, why don't you let everyone know what you've been up to and, and how you have come to be where you are today. Thanks, Sean. It is amazingly cool to be able to do something like this with one of my best friends and someone I've known for a long time, and um, I'm really glad to talk to the CEA community, and I know what an important organization that is, and leading the country into into new into new futures and so um, yeah my background I'm, the, I'm currently the chief of staff for the Republican National Committee um, that is the the, the campaign and, and national headquarters of the Republican Party in the United States um, I got I, I grew up in England um, I was nine years old when Margaret Thatcher was elected I was uh, 10 years old when Ronald Reagan was elected so I called them my, my surrogate political parents and uh, I was that geek that was into politics when I was growing up, and I was in I was in Britain with my father, who uh, uh, worked for a really unheard of uh, agency called the NSA that no one is no one knows <laughs> about. At least they didn't in the 80s when I was there. And so we were there on a on a on a uh, you know on a NATO mission. And so uh, public policy and things that are bigger than yourself were sort of uh, dinner table conversations for us. So I wound up coming to George Mason University where I'm. Met Sean Murphy uh, because I wanted to be near Washington. I wanted to be near politics, and so uh, since then I've I've worked in various campaigns. I worked for Newt Gingrich for five years as communications director. I worked on House races. I was the chief of staff for a member of Congress from uh, the Seattle area named Dave Reichert. And uh, when I worked for Dave, uh, he had Redmond in his district, and so um, uh, Microsoft, Nintendo USA. There are a lot of uh, Amazons in, in that area. There's a there's a lot of really really important tech companies out in the Seattle area and it really actually taught me a lot about tech culture um, this was right you know coming off the heels of the Justice Department um, uh, bringing an antitrust suit against Microsoft and having a lot of people in the tech sector understand how important government is how much it can sort of wreck your life and wreck what you're, you're, what you're trying to do and, and, and it, what was amazing about that we can get into it if we want but what was amazing about it was that even after the, the, the you know Justice Department had almost destroyed the company, you still had an attitude amongst a lot of people in the tech sector that, you know, the government's not that important, I'm inventing the future, and, and so interacting with them was really, really educational to me in terms of the intersection between um, tech and politics, not only in terms of what we use for tech, but I'm talking about culturally between how the different worlds are. And, uh, and so uh, the last four years I was working at an organization called the National Republican Congressional Committee that does house races. We won Congress in 2010. Um, and then uh, last year worked at the House again when we elected the second largest majority for Republicans since World War II. And then uh, March 1st of last year, so a little over a year, I've been at the Republican National Committee as the Chief of Staff. So congratulations. I, I continue to be, you know, humbled and, and amazed at, at how far you've traveled. And, and, you know, if anything, you're being modest in terms of the scope of what you've achieved and, and witnessed. But I, I recall fondly, because, you know, you and I have – literally lived through really that revolution of when you and I started college we were using typewriters and by the time we graduated granted it was dot matrix printers but we were already into computers and then in the next couple of years the internet took over but if I recall correctly I believe your first job or internship was to go into the office at four in the morning and clip the papers from the various newspaper clip, clip pieces from the various newspapers for your boss so when he got to work that morning he'd understand what the hot news items were, which is, I, I think, a scenario that would be inconceivable to, you know, a 20-year-old today. 
Yeah, it's one of the fun things about um, one of the many fun things about being the chief of staff here now is that my my first job in politics. So kind of in in the same vein, the very first job that I did here was down on the first floor of this building working at the RNC in an hourly wage job where I was doing a database entry job and I was entering quotes from Bill Clinton into a database. And so, um, and I mean, it was a really rudimentary sort of tab through a bunch of fields and type things in and then hit send and then look through another sort of document. And and, uh, and so that, and that, by the way, that job was like, it was a uh, pay cut from waiting tables. Um, <laughs> and, right. And so, and then, uh, then a job came open that I think paid 17 grand a year to be the clips boy. And that was the job you're talking about where I came in every morning at 4 a.m. And that's because that's the earliest I could come in. If I if I had come in, if I could come in at 3, I would have, but the newspapers came out at 4. Right. And so I right. love talking right. to our young and I meet, meet with interns at different young groups to say, yeah, we, I used to have these things called newspapers. <laughs> and that's how we got yeah. news. And I literally cut them out by hand. The technology I was using, by the way, was like a $100,000 photocopier that had like a touch screen on it to copy the clips and turn them back into other paper products and then delivering them around the building, um, including the chairman who was Haley Barber at the time who came in at 7 a.m. very early every every morning. And so I had an eclipse on his desk. So, yeah, it, it's sort of fun to watch the look on young people's faces when they just can't comprehend that your job was, like, within my lifetime, someone had a job to go back and cut things out with a pair of scissors and deliver it to people. But Right, and, and I think what's important about that, besides you know, a aging us and and showing how how much the world has changed, the the reality, and and we're we're of course very obsessed with this at CEA, giving kind of a a longitudinal historical perspective to how when we look at you know from historical terms, technology, the radical advancements, but in real time, other than maybe the internet, the the this changes aren't really seismic. You don't notice them at the time, which is to say. The technology you were using, that hundred thousand dollar photocopier, was something that probably your predecessors would have marveled at and said, you know, wow, what, how, how much this is changing uh, the future of the world. Yeah, I mean, and, and uh, at that time we'd also had a state of the art television studio put in the basement that we still use here at the RNC. That was a brand new thing. They started uh, the chairman started doing something where he um, uh, was uh, uploading. To the, uh, our own uh, television program to a satellite and downloading it to cable systems across the country. It was called GOP TV, and so uh, we had our own TV station. We still we actually still use a lot of the equipment and facilities that were that were put into the building back then. But that was pretty revolutionary for a political party to have their entire own television studio built out, and that was the that was the medium by which you communicated to people. If you could if you could do something on television, then you that's the point where you're really saturating. You know, audiences and getting a getting a broadcast message out to people. That's what was really important. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a different. There, there's still, of course, that's still very important, right? But sure. the fact that 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 was in 19, I think 90. It would have been in 93 or 94 that that studio got put in and was like a really big deal that the TV studio was put in here. And, and you know, I think the, your point is is well taken in the sense that, of course, TV is still you know the the medium where everyone has a TV in their house, but the idea that uh, you're you're not nearly uh, doing your yourself justice if you limit yourself to print or you know uh, TV. I would imagine, like with everything we talk about in this series with innovation, there's so much good about that, but it's also I would imagine intimidating and overwhelming in the sense that how do you ensure and and what strategies do you use to make sure you're reaching not only as large an audience as possible but as targeted an audience as possible. And I think. Uh, when we talk about that, inevitably we start getting into things like big data and, and the ways in which um, political operations are, are using these just like corporations are. And I would imagine in some ways in an even more targeted and efficient fashion to ensure that a base is being reached to, to maximize turnout and engagement. Um, but yeah, I know you can speak directly to, you know, really jumping from basically what you just said, like TV being cutting edge and, and still certainly important, but the ways in which it isn't just a matter of, it's the internet now, it's, it's how are we using the internet effectively. Yeah, and I mean, this is, you know, CEA puts out reports and on trends and these sorts of things that we read, and this is how we learn about a lot of this stuff, but what we all know is that cable subscription just keeps going down, and people are looking and getting information in different screens and different places, and in the end, political you know, party committees like the one that I work at are essentially marketing operations. 
We are trying to find an audience. We're trying to find customers, segment them out, understand something about them, go and find them in the space that they live in and deliver uh, a message to them to have them carry out an act, which in our case is voting for someone um, and influence them in that way. And so, um, you know, if you, if you look at the marketing world and the, and the private sector that's not in, in the political sector, the, the digital and data operations are growing, they're in-house, and they're becoming the marketing operations. And I think you're seeing that trend in politics. It's certainly, you know, President Obama um, did a very, very good job in both of his last elections of putting a lot of resources behind it. And, and that's what really, that's, that's the, the most important lesson. You have to put resources into, into those things to be successful at them. Um, you know, when you go back to 2004, when President Bush was reelected, um, they'd been in office for four years. They had the ability to put resources into their their both their um, data operation and their ground game, and they did a, did a very very good job of it. Um, and you look at the converse happened in 2012. Um, you know, the Obama campaign was able to put a lot more resources into building up uh, their data operation, and the Republican Party was going through a messy primary and had a lot of other things to do. And so, um, yeah, really, you know, if you look at what the what the RNC, where I work, and what the Romney campaign did, they, I believe they performed miracles in the time that they had and the things that they were given, but it's just very difficult to, to compare apples to apples with a, a an incumbent presidential campaign. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the resources that the Republican Party has had for years have been very, very good, the base data that they've had and the information that they've had, but it really comes down to how many um, you know resources that you have to dedicate to something. And, and so the challenge that we have now going into 2016, well, first of all, 2014, this year, mm -hmm. um, and then into 2016, is as a party committee to be better and put the right resources into it so that we can catch up, and our goal is to leapfrog the Democrats, because that's sort of what's happened in the past is we've leapfrogged one another, right. um, to put the right resources in and learn the right lessons and dedicate the right uh, priorities to make sure that we catch up on the data front and campaigns. And living through it at the time with you, I, I know you were instrumental. You were, you were a very vocal voice. Uh, I think in, in your aforementioned experience being out in Washington, also being, as we've said, a product of this generation and, and really seeing on a daily basis the ways in which all of this technology really impacts virtually every aspect of, of business and personal life. Um, but you, you are to be you know, credited, and I think you have been celebrated accordingly, for being a pretty early uh, vocal voice in understanding how crucial this data was and, and, and using those, utilizing those resources effectively and, and wisely. Um, did you find that initially there was resistance? I would imagine, again, just like in any other industry, there's the old guard that, that kind of inherently resists change because it's not the way things have done and you whippersnappers have no idea how these things work. Did it take kind of a butt kicking data wise for that to sink in or, or did you find that gradually you know, people just sort of got it, or or was it not an age gap at all? Is it just some people are are more tech savvy than others? But you know, I know it wasn't an overnight process. But again, I you you are you were very much in the vanguard in understanding this very early on. Well, I, you know, it's funny. You you think you're in the vanguard, and you think you understand things until you get around experts, right? I mean, I'm not a data expert. I'm not a technician. Um, mm -hmm. What I tell people is, you know, what what a, what people who are who write apps would tell me is. Uh, I can't design an app that changes a management structure. Um, you know, I mean, that's where the priorities have to be put into place there first. And so, I don't look at it. I, I do think that the party in general ha has to ha change its culture a little bit, but I also think it's very prone to change its culture. I think that it wants to. It wants the RNC to be better at this. Um, our entire donor community does, and then a lot of the the, the data experts that we've had for years in the can in the party um, have just at, at times lack the resources they need. However, I do think that they also have to be, we do need to take advantage of some of the other things that are available to us. We hired at the RNC um, some staff. We hired a CTO, which is, is a position that had never existed before right. um, uh, from Facebook. His name's Andy Barquette. Uh, we opened an office out in San Mateo, California um, for the first time. It's a satellite office of the RNC, and Andy works out in California. Um, we hired a chief data officer. We never had one of those before. Um, uh, his name is Azarius Rito. He, he previously worked at LinkedIn and and was at a startup called Meritful. Um, we've just hired a data architect from Yahoo who's working out in California. Um, our chief digital officer, another position we never had, is a guy named uh, Chuck DeFeo, who was who ran 
the 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 uh, what would have been called e campaign for President Bush in 2004 when we were doing very well um, with social media and 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 email and online marketing. And so I actually um, asked him to come back. Uh, and I think what a lot of people recognize is that we were doing very very well through 04, and then we got leapfrogged in this sort of space race. Um, you know, we we didn't innovate as much as we should have, and and on that, especially on the social media side, Chuck wanted to come back and sort of finish, I think, what he had started. And, you know, he even had some Democrats that had mentioned to him, like, working on panels. We took what Bush had done in 04 and kept going. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so I don't, I think it's, I think you're being very kind um, to say all of those things. I don't, I don't believe that I'm, um, I think that I'm a manager that recognizes, I, I think that this was an existential problem for the party that we have to get right. And I believe that we've had some very, very solid people that for years, by the way, have been electing a lot of Republicans. Um, and so when you, you know, when you win an election, everyone's a genius. And when you right. lose, everyone's an idiot. And neither one of those two things are true. I think that the Obama team gets so much credit because they did. And they, look, they did. They obviously did very well. Yeah. But they did very well because they had a, a ton of resources put in. And they had a lot of very good management decisions made to give them the resources. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's not true to say that the Republican Party is bereft of having uh, really, really smart people. Uh, yeah. who have then been doing data things for years because there's a um, across the street from me there's a Republican House of Representatives there's 29 Republican governors across the country and almost every one of them has been elected by using information that came from this building over the last years but so right. what what I what I looked at it as recognize that this is an existential problem for the party that we have to be better at this try and bring the resources in and try and go and grab folks from the private sector that could come supplement that and, and help us change the culture to base everything on so that we're, we're putting at the heart of what we do, data and technology. Right, right. And, and I think what that, that speaks to, you know, really pretty explicitly, and it, it seems like in every one of these conversations I have that there is, there is like one moment that sort of crystallizes in, in very concrete terms where this intersection occurs. And I, and I think the whole, uh, you know, cliched notion of adapt or perish is, is basically exactly what you're describing, which is it's a combination of historical shifts and forces, but also just the reality on the ground. We need to take advantage and we should take advantage of all this technology and all these, you know, opportunities that didn't exist, which means we have to understand them. And more importantly, we have to have people that are efficient using them. I think it would be helpful because I know when we've talked in the past, you have described uh, the notion of an arms race between political parties, maybe within within organizations, within campaigns. Give me an example. You know, walk the audience that that isn't uh, you know as savvy at some of these things, or maybe doesn't even understand the depth uh, and breadth of of how this is applied. An example of um, how, say, for instance, data mining and, and really kind of targeting voters. Um, you know, works on a practical level in, in, in ways that it didn't or couldn't work five, ten years ago? Well, I, what I'll do then, let me give you an example of sort of a case, um, the, which was a special election that was just run in Florida's 13th Congressional District, um, which, you know, was overseen by Rob Sims, um, of course, a good friend of ours from the NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Committee. Um, and that was a race where, I mean, the, you know, the NRCC put $2.9 million on television. They were on the ground early. They had, um, uh, you know, put a, made a lot of early strategic decisions in that race. There's a lot that goes into a campaign. So you, it's hard to just say that this won the race or that won the race. There's certainly sure. with a lot of very, very important decisions the NRCC made in, in winning that campaign. And it was a tough campaign. It was one where, as a district that Alex Sink, the, the Democratic nominee, had carried as uh, when she was a gu gubernatorial candidate and Obama won it twice, but it had been held by a Republican congressman for many years, Bill Young, until he passed away. And so, but our role in that, working with the NRCC, was a very important one, which was starting to bring online a lot of the the, the innovations that we've been working on um, at the RNC in, in terms of improving our, our data and technology. Where it starts for us is, is with having ground troops. So we had already put um, field staff very, very early on into Florida, um, even before... The, the election was called as a special election, but we had we had uh, staff on the ground. They'd been recruiting local uh, precinct captains. So you have it starts for us in building relationships, and and really a lot of the tech tools that you can re you can talk about in politics are to help you uh, help and help you understand voters and help you build relationships with them. Because in the end, politics is about building relationships on almost every single level. And so having a field staff that was there already on the ground 
that could begin to build relationships uh, in the district was very important. There was 165 precincts within that congressional district that we thought these are the key targeted precincts where it's going to matter. And by the end of the race, in a short time, we had 135 of them uh, built out with precinct captains and local uh, and local um, uh, volunteers who are very committed um, to helping you. Uh, we were then able to uh, put into their hands a, a canvassing app that was it something you download onto your um, smartphone. And so this is something that um, you know it's it's it was done through the the, the Florida Republican Party. Um, you know, uh, in, in con working in conjunction with them, and they're able to use the canvassing app to go door to door um, and qu and question voters and and do dynamic scripting where they can find information about the voters and upload that right back into our main voter file. And so you're in a real way you're making the the data that you have about voters better in a real way uh, every moment of every day that you have those people out in the field. We then have brought online um, a voter scoring system, uh, and so this is something using uh, survey data, uh, large survey data, uh, and a lot of different um, uh, consumer data that we're able to attach to um, the information we have about voters. It used to be that we would really put voters into one of maybe four or five buckets, you know, uh, um, um, a likely Republican voter, um, a low propensity Republican voter, we would sort of scale them out that way. We were able to look at the voters in that election in a one through 100 scale and give them a much more granular um, uh, vote score so that we could go and determine you know, which are the most important voters for us to look at as you start getting down to, especially at the end of an election, where you've got limited resources and a limited number of people that you can get to in a certain number of days. And then we're able to put all of that uh, analytics into something we call a control panel, um, which is something that can be brought up on a desktop so that you can actually look and see the information and understand it. A lot of times in a campaign, you'll go out and do a survey, do a poll, and you learn something about the voters, and you may not do another one for another two months and you may, oh wow, we, we have a huge problem with this certain group of voters here. You know, we're losing younger unmarried women by a bigger margin than we thought something happened. This type of technology allows you to understand that in real time on a daily basis so that you can start fixing the problems as they happen. And so that, that I think the combination of those things, they all work together. Um, they, I mean, it starts with having good voter data in the first place so that you understand the Florida voters before you even begin the election and then putting all of those tools in people's hands, that's the way that a lot of campaigns now are going to interact with information and technology. It's something that, admittedly, the Democrats were, were doing um, and that we are putting resources in so that we can do it as well, working with. And then, and then, and then the other thing for me is, um, as much as you're talking about technology, having the right staff, having the right people on your team that um, can solve problems, that have the ability to um, you know, help you, whether it's solving a problem because you're writing a piece of code or whether it's solving a problem because you understand the voter file from your experience and you can bring that experience together, um, that really, really matters because all of these things are, are interesting, but if you don't have a good team to help utilize them, and that's where a lot of the resources have to go as well. So that's just a, that's one example of how we are, we just very recently successfully used a lot of the stuff we're talking about to win an election. Yeah, and, and I mean that that's that that's exactly. I mean, there there's a real world example, and I think you you bring up a very important point, which is we can get lost, of course, in the technology and and the innovation that we we should celebrate. The the fact of the matter is, any of these advancements, any of these technologies, require people that know how to use them. Um, and I think in politics, as much or perhaps more than art, it's the human element ultimately, uh, the establishing of connections ways of, of communicating effectively, I think it's it's fair to say that a lot of these things are tools that need to be used wisely and, and effectively. But at the end of the day, it, it always comes down to people. Um, you know, I think you and I can appreciate the ways in which maybe 15 or 20 years ago, the world was an analog world. Therefore, these processes were analog processes by default. Whereas today, perhaps it can it can be too much of a good thing. And maybe people want to take shortcuts and think that social media and all manner of, of internet-driven, you know, digital correspondence can solve the problems. I think you hit on a, a crucial point, and I know you can elaborate on that in the, the sense of the human touch uh, is, is always crucial. And, and I think it's a good antidote to anyone who really feels that all of this information and all of these advancements have made the world way too complicated and you can't keep up. I think it's, it, it's crucial to remember that slowing down these things are all tools, but at the end of the day, it's all about how you communicate and, and 
having a, a meaningful engagement with whatever your audience happens to be. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the one of the things that that I think that we have done well in the past, and we need to keep getting better at that. The other the other party has done well is using these tools to help build relationships. As I said, I mean, um, you know, it, it is one thing for uh, me to to put a television ad on TV and yell at you and tell you to buy a product. That's one thing. But when, but if Sean Murphy is a Facebook friend of mine and or or a Google Hangout friend of mine, a Google Plus friend of mine, and sends me a note and says, um, "I really like this," that is a much more powerful, as as every study has shown, yeah. way to get a message across. And so politics is ready made for that. I mean that that really is it, it's a it's a world that it fits very well with that. And, and it, just because as we're saying, you have you have people that are walking through precincts. Or either p calling someone from a call, you know, from a headquarters on the phone, but or or knocking on their door. That's mm -hmm. about a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Right. That's a le le less about a big ideological fight or something on television. That's about two people talking to one another about something they believe in. And a lot of these things that we're talking about enable that. They make that easier. And so it's a matter of how do you take advantage of that? How do you learn something about the voters and learn who their who their connectors are and who are the people that can get information to them that would really matter to help influence them. Uh, and so, and, that, and that's a big part of uh, the tools that we're trying to build. And again, it all comes back to, and you said big data, it all really comes back to how, how good and how rich and how accurate the information is that you're starting off from. And so then you sort of loop back around to how many other tools can you build to make sure that that information you're starting from is good and that you're mining it and you're bringing it in all the time so that it just sort of feeds on itself and gets better and better. But at the heart of all of that stuff is building relationships. Right. Um, yeah, and again, like it, it, it couldn't be more obvious in politics for all the right reasons. I, I'm curious how, what, what keeps you up at night when it comes to these things? Is, is there a certain peace knowing that on one level you, you, we can't keep up with every advancement, uh, but on the other hand, one, one never wants to be asleep at the wheel or become complacent. I feel like the last few uh, presidential elections, you know, as you pointed out, starting probably in 04, really have almost maybe ensured that no one will be asleep at the wheel and you know it's incumbent upon uh, everyone with an investment in politics both on the inside and the outside to be abreast and, and be aware of what's going on but how do you balance um, you know what you know and, and what you could know and what you should know or some of that just it's just gonna play out the way it plays out well I mean like I said in the end for me uh, you know, I have to have people around me that are the experts that know things and I have to rely on them and, and thank God we have really really good people in our party that do know these things, but this is why I think that the space race analogy is so good. I mean, and, you know, the, the Democrats put up Sputnik, we can put a, a man on the moon and create the shuttle program if we build the right NASA, and so that's the intensity that you have to bring every day, and in the end that comes down to resources. Mm -hmm. You know, if a country is committed to a space program, it puts the resources necessary into their NASA, and and then they can, they can do all kinds of things, and uh, and so for me, what's what's different is, you know, we were talking about what Obama did and we were talking about what President Bush did. They were candidates, and, and we're not a candidate. We're a party committee. And so the mission that we've given ourselves is to try and, and put this at the party committee level, put it at the heart of the party, and have it be something that we produce here and that we share with the rest of our party, trying to build an ecosystem that the whole rest of the Republican Party can plug into. So you have this base uh, voter information and, and relationship building tools, but then we allow all the other campaigns to plug into that, to use whatever tool they want and have it speak to our information and help them. And so um, all of that is, that's the vision, that's where we're headed, but it, it just comes back to, if you talk about what keeps me up at night, it's, it's getting the resources in the door to pay for all of it. Um, uh, it costs money when you're not a, a presidential candidate. I think Obama put about $300 million into his data infrastructure, and you can do that when you're raising a billion dollars as a presidential campaign. Uh, we've got to do it at a party committee level, which means being smart. But um, it's it's as with every budget, it's about prioritization and deciding what you think is really important. And uh, I think that we've decided this is the most important. This and the ground game are the most important things that we can do. Well, uh, that, that that's good stuff as expected. And and I would imagine, be, well, I know you as a person, but being in your line of work re requires kind of a congenital optimism. But when you think about the future, uh, I have to imagine you are one that embraces whatever's coming down the pike and, and are, are confident that both now and going forward, uh, more and more people will be embracing these kind of myriad opportunities and, and, and ways to infuse uh, everyone's endeavors uh, with working smarter and not necessarily harder. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm optimistic about this. And 
uh, you know, one of the great things about sort of the community that I'm and as Republicans is that um, the culture is changing. There are a lot of good firms that we work with that are that understand this in the private sector that want to work with us. Um, you know, the people understand that the, the Republican Party needs to be at the heart of this. Uh, we have outside friends and allies too that aren't part of the party, but they're also developing tools and, and innovating and raising resources for it. So, um, for us, it's 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 optimistic. Uh, it's an optimistic world because uh, I, everyone's sort of on the same page about how important this is. Well, my friend, you 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 are being modest to not uh, take as much credit as I'd like to give you, but I think you are a, a very important part of why your party has has you know embraced this. And is using it effectively, using it uh, for positive outcomes, um, and and I expect you to to continue to be at the forefront of that. And you know, certainly, as someone from the CEA, it, it's wonderful to see and be able to speak to and, and glean knowledge from individuals, you know, from all walks of life that that really are embracing, that are living embodiments of why so much of what we do and, and invest in is is purposeful. And uh, the fear that people tend to have is that all this technology, you know, separates us. And I think you, your work proves that it's quite the contrary. These are mechanisms that help connect communities, bring people together, and make them feel like their lives and their votes are important. So I celebrate you and, and the work you do, both, you know, on the technology front and on the personal front. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely believe that these things help us, help bring us together. There's no doubt about it. Well, I'll tell you what, we, that, that's, a, that's a very good optimistic note to end on. We didn't really get into any controversy. I'd love to uh, uh, have you on again at, at your earliest convenience, and maybe we can dive a little bit into you know, some of the pitfalls of the social media world and, and the idea of now uh, people like yourself and, and campaign managers not only have to do all the things you've described, which certainly is a full-time job, but managing the brand of a politician and managing the uh, the process with which they interact and the ways technology helps that and it's and sometimes can hurt that. I, I'd love to you know get some good stories when names can certainly be changed to protect the innocent. All right, <laughs> we can do that. So, so, well, we'll we'll do this again soon. But for now, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. I, I hope everyone learned as much as I did and uh, enjoyed our discussion. Uh, Mike, keep up the good work and. Uh, you know, cheers. All right. Talk to you later, man. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.